Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Trondheim Kunst Museum and uh, this uh, seminar called uh, Towards a Future uh, Museum Glossary, A for Ability, T for Trust. My name is Johan Borgesen and I'm the director of the museum. This, uh, or a year and a half ago, I was contacted by a researcher at Copenhagen University who asked if the museum a Frontheim Kunstmuseum wanted to be part of a network for a Nordic network for museums uh, involved in or in, in, in a process of change who were uh, uh, in one way, way or another uh, evolving or changing, uh, changing form. Um, uh, of course I did. Of course we did. Uh, the Museum Y network uh, is comprised of Kiasma in Helsinki, Malmö Kunstmuseum, and Trondheim Kunstmuseum, and uh, as well as researchers at Copenhagen University. And um, as we are all in processes of change, it is important for us to ask ourselves why we are doing what we are doing. Um, and as we change into something different, we should look at uh, what that different thing should be, and that that, in a sense, will be an answer to the issue of why museums in, uh, in our current day. Um, Trondheim Kunstmuseum is involved right now in a very uh, uh, intense process of redefining ourselves, of, of finding, uh, finding our role in a possible new uh, collaboration, a merger, uh, in any case it will be a new constellation uh, with Nordenfjelska Kunstindustri Museet. Uh, debates are uh, running as to which building we should occupy and a lot of attention has been focused on specifically the idea of the museum as a building. And, um, this makes it all the more important for those of us, uh, the museum, yes, it is a type of building, but it is also, and more importantly, a type of activity. And those of us who uh, work with this activity have to define what it is that we uh, want to do and why we are doing it. And so when you are in a process of change, change can be daunting, change can be exciting, change can be a lot of things, but, um, when in a process of change, you want to have someone there with you. You want to compare notes with others who have been or are in a similar situation. And also, you need to put words to this change that you're going through. And uh, so the Museum Y and this seminar is our, uh, are our answers to this, uh, to this need. So for this seminar, which will be today and, uh, and half tomorrow, we have invited a number of speakers and thinkers on various subjects that are uh, close to our hearts and close to our minds uh, at, this, uh, at this point. We will be talking about how museums address uh, art that is no longer only paintings to be hung on walls and, and appreciated by by uh, viewers, but art that, that grips into society in a more, uh, in, in stronger and also more subtle ways. We will be looking at the expectations of the museum as a building and al possibly alternatives to those expectations. Uh, can the museum be a network? Can the museum be, be many buildings, uh, functions in other activities and so on? We will be looking at what happens when, if uh, what mustn't happen happens, if the museum burns down and there's nothing left. Um, uh, how can we uh, conceive of the museum as digital fragments of what once was? And uh, uh, tomorrow we will also be looking at the role of of, uh, uh, of the museum as something other than a collection of objects and a collection of ideas to be projected to, to an audience. Uh, the museum is something uh, perhaps more open, something 
uh, more dialogical. Um, so we have a lot to do. I'm, I'm very uh, happy to, uh, uh, to start off with uh, uh, Sebastian uh, Sichowski. Was that, was that right? Uh, so please, the floor is yours. First of all, I have a terrible reputation for never-ending uh, presentations. So, I have to, uh, but first of all, I'm like uh, super excited to be here. It's uh, you know, how the hell is it possible? Even you know, like I'm opening a major exhibition tomorrow. So you know, being here, it's a little bit uh, surreal experience. But also, I haven't traveled professionally for a long time. I might be a little bit unfocused because of all those like distractors, but uh, I will do my best. But first of all, I'm like thank you for inviting me. It's uh, great to be here. I'm enjoying the snow, your presence, company, you know, good talks, and um, you know, I'm also like a very passionate uh, and stubborn producer of glossaries and lexicons. So that's probably why I'm here, and uh, and this kind of future museology is something which I've been kind of doubling at for many years. I'm trying to kind of imagine the future of those, you know, weird uh, devices which we invented and we kind of petrified in the 19th century. So, uh, yeah, so I selected a few... Uh, wait, not yet. <laughs> I've selected a few uh, kind of uh, terms from my kind of ample uh, folders, and uh, I will I will share like three terms with you, and to kind of start to kind of like delineate what I've been struggling with. Um, I will start with those images, like a kind of random Google image, uh, museum audience in the museum image, and Mila Laderman Yukilis, you know, like working uh, on her uh, kind of. Uh, land uh, project uh, on the Staten Island. So, so um, basically, I was tr we had like a little closed session uh, in the morning and I was really like, you know, it was also like very important for me to share those, those, those things and kind of my fascination with those movements. You know, because it was, as, as you said, it's not about buildings, it's about activities, it's about like, you know, also like gathering and, uh, you know, Sometimes, uh, you know, moving without traveling, you know, it also happens a lot. But basically, what, 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 what I'm dealing with in my daily work is like, like observing, uh, comparing, analyzing, and, and uh, most of all, like supporting those, those movements from the museum to the kind of reality as we speak, like social, political movements. Uh, uh, scientific centers and so on. So I'm like super like, fascinated by artists who migrated from art somewhere else. So they ended up being scientists. They ended up being like politicians, prime ministers. We know this case. Uh, or you can s observe like this kind of opposite direction movement when this box, which is very kind of you know rigid and disciplined, and uh, you know, yeah, it's kind of petrified, uh, is uh, kind of licking, <laughs> or like it's like loses, it's kind of, you know, like uh, uh, the walls are like falling apart and those activities, those movements, those phenomena are kind of, you know, s sipping into the, the museum. So like I'm the pretty much fascinated by non-artistic kind of phenomena being uh, taken care of actually in, in, in places which we call museums. Or like the third case is like, you know, like the, 
if you can recall the famous Wittgenstein's uh, uh, illustration, the rabbit duck figure, the mascot. This is the rabbit duck phenomenon. Uh, of course, Wittgenstein used it, but there are like many other people who who enjoyed this caricature. This actually the the, the drawing, which was uh, first uh, published in the 19th century, and uh, the rabbit duck figure. It's a very strange creature. Yeah, it's like uh, it's both. Yeah, it's like uh, it has like double uh, ontology. You know, it's 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 the rabbit and the duck, but it depends on on you, like what you are putting into the, the, the very moment of looking at things and naming things and recognizing things. But the most fascinating thing is like being able to kind of flicker between both things, you know? So there are like many practices, many beautiful practices, artistic, post-artistic practices, I will come back to this term later, when uh, something what might be recognized as uh, work of our museological kind of, you know, apparatus being applied to it. I mean, conserving, disseminating, cataloging and so on, but at the same time, it's a part of something else. And, uh, and I think, yeah, this is like to summarize what I'm do doing, dealing with, it's like I'm looking at the moments when art becomes a part of something else, other systems. And, uh, and of course, like talking about, about museums, we have to take uh, into consideration that we as humans are like facing our extinction soon. So it's like high time to kind of rethink, you know, what is our role and uh, we can look back, we can look at some writings, at some, some artworks, also like from the, from the 20th century and, and, and earlier, uh, telling us what to do actually, you know, so it's more about like using what we already have instead of like producing new things, you know, like so it's uh, when we talk about like those glossaries, lexicons and so on, uh, I, uh, I would say it's much more interesting to look at uh, things which uh, were there, like these promises which were not fulfilled because we are a very capricious also like a kind of community we like uh, new fashions, like new tendencies, new turns in, in art, and so we very often like lose our interest in some like things which uh, we should be establishing like a more like a long-term relationship. We are not very monogamous as a community. <laughs> like we are like, we like, like those kind of uh, uh, short life affairs. Yeah, but this is all about, yeah, as conservative as it might sound from somebody who came from Poland, you know, like we are looking at monogamous uh, relationship in curatorial work, you know, with certain communities, with certain like collectives and so on. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so before I will um, talk about my three examples, three terms, and uh, during this kind of lockdown period, I really learned how to be very much down to earth also in, in a literal sense, like rolling on the soil, you know, <laughs> like it's not only <laughs> about being concrete or uh, to the point, but uh, I will try to illustrate it with some like tangible examples. So we are not getting too theoretical, we are not get getting too flamboyant about like catchy phrases, but it's also about like the daily, even not very sometimes exciting routine of uh, 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 kind of uh, supporting certain systems, certain activities, and so on. So I would start with, uh, before we, we move to those three terms, um, which you had at the first slide, which is the endospore uh, term stolen from biology, one-to-one uh, -one scale stolen from many people, Luis Carroll, Umberto Eco, S S Stephen Wright, you know, all those guys, who guys mainly, who use this in their like writings. And uh, rewilding, which is kind of appropriated from as a one of the uh, you know forms of like uh, na nature preservation uh, kind of policies uh, from the 90s. So I'm 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 starting with Louis uh, Kamnitzer because I'm very much fascinated by Louis Kamnitzer, this uh, uh, conceptual artist from Uruguay, and uh, he wrote this uh, fantastic essay, and I would like to introduce the the the. the character, the main character for our little meeting, which is the genie. Genie living in a bottle, like genie in the in the in a container, in a in a in a vase or I don't know where genies live nowadays. Well, some in some kind of boxes, you know. But uh, there is like a fantastic essay by by Kamnitzer 
uh, called Where is the Genie? And, uh, and, and Kamnitzer being like uh, not only a fantastic uh, conceptual artist, but also an, a, a prolific uh, writer and, uh, and educator, uh, reform, reformer, like he was really like reforming the, the art education in Uruguay. He's comparing our art system uh, to a kind of gigantic genie uh, research kind of gang, you know, like uh, or like uh, a genie busters kind of, uh, you know, commando. <laughs> so, so we are like um, looking at vases, bottles, and so on. We have mastered the. Uh, knowledge about the evolution of the forms of those containers you know like we uh, know how they are like changing you know we know the shapes we know the textures we know the materials uh, we exhibit those boxes those containers those bottles in the museums but in the end we really we are all about the genie we are all excited about the genie uh, that lives inside you know like it's not about the containers but the thing is like genie is invisible yeah, so so we what only what we can do we can exhibit the the bottle the container the cup whatever but we believe that the the the, the spirit is inside nobody saw him or her or them so the problem is that uh, genie might not exist that would be uh, you know like really disappointing end of our scenario but uh, but to keep this metaphor going, you know, like uh, there are like some moments in the art history and the art theory where we are trying to get rid of the boxes and we are trying to get rid of the bottles and we are looking at the genie, trying to look at the genie. So, so basically those uh, three terms, it's like, yeah, my, I can apply this genie thing to those. Like in the first case, it would be like releasing the genie from the bottle. The second would be uh, letting the genie, mm, yeah, I will come to back to it. Yeah, when we have the, yeah, I have some like crazy ideas about what genie might do. But you know, like you know the metaphor. You know, like it's like it's really about celebrating something which is in art, in artworks, which is not visible, which we believe it's there. So we have to create. We did it in 19th century, this apparatus of making people believe that the genie is there. So it's not only the thing which is hanging there, it's much more. It's much deeper than just looking at things. So uh, it's a very complicated, very complex uh, apparatus. I had a slide with like, how complex it is. So the scale. Uh, the first term, S is for scale, scale one to one. So this is, this is, this is uh, a term uh, which was kind of popularized by the Canadian uh, theorist, writer Stephen Wright, after Louis Carroll and his story uh, about the adventures of Sylvie and Bruno from the 19th century. And uh, Stephen Wright, who is also like a very kind of, you know, passionate uh, lexicon writer, he disappeared. Like, I'm unfortunately, you know, I really admire this guy, but he kind of vanished from my radars. Uh, he's, he grew this gigantic Santa Claus beard and settled down, and he's like a permaculture farmer now, somewhere in a little village in France. So I lost the track of him. So he doesn't write more. I don't know. Maybe this is like the kind of materialization of his ideas, like being a permaculture person. But he uh, used this, uh, this, this, this metaphor, this one-to-one -one thing uh, uh, in, his, in his lexicon about the, the, the science of usership, the use of art, the use value of art, uh, uh, bringing back those, uh, this, this, this uh, actually quite beautiful story about uh, farmers and cartographers. You know, like this, it's a very strange book. I tried to read it, but uh, all those like political, uh, you know, connections like like um, metaphors uh, dealing with the daily political situation in the 19th century England doesn't really speak to me, but it's still funny. And uh, and there is like a story of farmers who are like commissioning a, a map, uh, like you know, like a very precise map. They want it. They want it to. Uh, they want to have like an efficient, you know, uh, farming system. 
So they are very picky about like the, the accuracy of the of the map. So the, the cartographers are making like map which is like you know one to twenty, like one to ten, one to five, and so on. And uh, and the formats are not satisfied enough. So 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 the cartographers they come up with this brilliant idea of creating a one to one scale map. So like every branch, every leaf, every rock is on the map, you know. So so the but the farmers are not happy about it, you know. Like they say, if you cover, if you unroll the map, you will you will block the sunlight. So it will like disastrous for the crop. And uh, so the cartographers, they take time, they think about it, and um, they come up like in the morning and they say, hey, we have an idea. Why not we use the land as a map? Let's pretend that the, the, the territory, this, 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 your, your, your fields, they are the map. So it's everything is like one to one, you know, like it's like he, it's, it's precise, you can measure it and so on. And say, yes, let's do it. And it works. You know, it's like uh, the most precise map of the, on the planet. So this was, uh, you know, like this motif was, yeah, it kept coming back in like Umberto Eco's uh, this, this uh, essay, actually quite a beautiful essay. Uh, the, the impossibility of drawing a map, a one-to-one -one, uh, scale map of the uh, um, uh, of something <laughs> I can't remember now. But uh, for for um, uh, for for Stephen Wright, that was a really handy metaphor of practices, which don't kind of replicate, making like copies, replicas of of existing things or situations which are happening beyond this wall. You know, so it's not. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> uh, it's not about, like, painting a landscape. It's about, like, you know, maybe, like, cultivating a land. But, yeah, maybe it's uh, this example is too stupid, but maybe it's not, like, about, like, reporting on, like, uh, you know, so some p kind of political movements, but creating one. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's more about, like, being a part of something, you know, like, not doubling with this, you know, idea of may that art is about, like, imitating something. It's not about imitating. Maybe it's sometimes it's about initiating something, you know? So, so, so there, of course, you know, we can, of course, you can think about, like, uh, thousands of examples, you know, thousands of examples, you know, like, of, of practitioners who uh, do, like, you know, make, like, greenhouses, you know, like cultivating something, you know, like uh, healing people, you know, like establishing communes and so on and so on. And there are like many runaways. This is very interesting. You know, people who are like educated as artists and they kind of vanished. Uh, they are doing something else, which can be, but doesn't have to be like recognized as artistic practice. And, and <laughs> this is, uh, I like this, you know, maybe I'm not it's recorded, so I cannot say it. But, um, um, you know, like, uh, Peter von Tiesenhausen is, like, a great example. Maybe not his practice, like, generally, a uh, Canadian uh, land artist. Uh, but what he did with his farm, I, thi I think it's, like, a very literal illustration for one-to-one -one scale practice. Uh, uh, Peter lives in a, in a, in a countryside, and there are like, you know, a lot of fracking going on in this area, you know, like they're pumping oil and, uh, you know, gases and so on. So there's like a total kind of destruction around this area. And uh, one of the companies decided to build, like to construct this big pipe going through his property, you know. So uh, actually like damaging the landscape and also like affecting the, the quality of his like life. So he copyrighted his land as a... Uh, as an artwork, that this is a ready-made piece, you know, like is you don't build like a pipe for this painting, yeah, it's like not fair, <laughs> you know, like so, uh, yeah, so they panicked, you know, and they started to send lawyers, and lawyers started to negotiate things with Peter, but Peter started to charge them because it was an artistic performance, so he was selling tickets before he started to sit down next to the table and so on, so they gave gave up. So I think it's like a really kind of nice. Uh, down to earth example, but uh, yeah, just to give you like a few examples of artists which are kind of dear to me, which which uh, were part of certain programs or like uh, which I'm kind of established like this kind of like an ongoing relationship uh, to to kind of illustrate this one to one scale paradox of using their territory as a map. 
Maybe, for example, Bonnie Orashark. She sadly died recently. She was like one of those like great eco-feminist heroes and uh, um, a fantastic artist uh, who, uh, yeah, I selected especially I selected this image, this early performance, which I really like. This is called "Sitting Still." It's from 1970s, and uh, I don't know if you can see. And yeah, maybe in this photo you can see it better. Uh, yeah, she had like very modest, like tiny interventions. Uh, like she's, she just, this, it's a, it's a, this gigantic puddle, it's a construction site next to a highway. Uh, Bonnie discovered this place, she fell in love with it, you know, like with all those like sticking out uh, pieces of furniture and so on. And she came back there and she was just, you know, like dressed beautifully, smoking cigarettes and contemplating the landscape. You know, it's like a very much kind of uh, dark ecology moment, you know, like nature doesn't exist, you know, like it's, uh, uh, you know, she's contemplating something which was created by those strange creatures called homo sapiens, you know, but at the same time, uh, you know, she was like kind of stressing up like the surreality of the, of, of, of the scene. And some years later, like 10 years later, she came back to the same spot and, uh, she established something which is called the farm. Uh, so under the highway, she, uh, you know, she settled down like a farm with a culture house, uh, which is very important for the, mm, uh, for the local uh, punk rock scene. You know, like uh, such bands as Seven Seconds and so on, like ha they had their debuts there, you know, like in this shed, you know. So, uh, and they had animals and they had like a kindergarten and it was really like uh, uh, focused on those, like on the neighbors, like neighboring communities. Uh, uh, so Bonnie uh, kind of dedicated herself to this mission, you know, like of sustaining a farm in this like devastated uh, area, like under the highway, on the outskirts of San Francisco, uh, keeping it alive, you know, like so, so you can imagine what was the reaction of art institutions, you know, like they completely lost their interest, you know, like because there was always the same. Yeah, it's like the same thing, the same practice, you go to work, you have to feed animals, you have to, you know, like, talk to children, you have to organize a concert, you have to, like, rent the equipment and so on. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, like, uh, quite a good example of this kind of one-to-one -one scale. An example now, to conclude with the one-to-one one, one -one scale, uh, I, I, I think you are, like, know where I'm getting now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just, like, a little example, I, I, I tried to add some experiments, sometimes like failed experiments from like our practice, like practice of the museum and the uh, office of for artistic service, which I'm also like a member even, you know, like it's like if you can imagine like the museum as this kind of big construction site, tangible walls, collection and so on. So the post, uh, the office for post artistic service doesn't have a website, doesn't have like, you know, an email account, doesn't have anything. But it's like 300 people, you know. So it's like a community, you know, people who are um, mm, delivering like art artistic services to social movements. Like if you need like a gigantic flags for your pro-choice <laughs> demonstration tomorrow, you're like address, you know, you're asking us. Uh, so this is like a kind of funny example of this kind of one-to-one -one thing of like recognizing what is there. Maybe it's also like a little bit too illustrative, but I kind of like the results of this thing. Uh, the Brudno Biennial. Brudno is a district in, 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 in Warsaw on the other side of the river where uh, we settled down a kind of sculpture park uh, 12 years ago. And... Uh, a Polish artist, sculptor, and uh, um, like not an activist, more like a kind of shaman <laughs> kind of figure, uh, Paweł Althammer, uh, he wanted to have a biennial there. You know, like, but uh, our idea was to do the biennial once and forever. You know, so it was like, you know, kind of uh, trick and uh, and uh, so the idea was to as we know as we know that that the, this area this district quite well we have like our relationship like a kind of solid relationship with some like communities there and uh, 
some uh, uh, artists and non-artists, gardeners and so on, we decided to kind of uh, uh, celebrate the biennial, which consisted of uh, venues only, not artworks by venues. So we didn't invite any artists, like our Pavel and uh, his collaborator, Goszka Matsuga, who's also like a quite a established artist, like mainly British now, but she's from Poland. Uh, we had like this mission of recognizing places which might be interesting for the audience. You know, so, so the neighbors, like the people who lived in the, in the Brudno district, nominated places. Like the gardening plot, an interesting balcony, a concrete slab, which is uh, a mysterious thing, which we have no idea what is it for. And we kind of, uh, you know, enlisted those things we, and we used our museum apparatus. You know, it's, a, it's very well calibrated, yeah? You produce catalogs, you have like guided tours, you have like visual identity and everything. So we activated like the whole, you know, you know, apart, you know uh, uh, apparatus. And uh, so, yeah, and this is like the map for the biennial, you know, like you can visit those uh, places and... Uh, uh, n for example, visit like a tourist, like a very shady, I can say that because they don't exist any longer, like a shady uh, kind of tourist office on the top floor of one of the block of flats, and they had like an amazing view. So like actually the piece, so to speak, in the, in the biennial was their window. So you can ring the bell, you know, like go take the lift, go to the top floor and ask them to show the, show the, the, the district from, from, from the top. So uh, and, uh, and we wrote text also about all those pla uh, all those places, uh, trying to use our you know like we are like you know kind of charged with all those theories. We can you know write good text about things you know like they don't have to be art you know like we they are like symbols for something that might be like uh, critical they might be political politically charged and so on, and uh, yeah this was. So such an amazing sound piece. It was like a broken kind of vent uh, opening. It was making this, drrr, you know, like weird sound, like randomly beautiful piece, like, you know, really beautiful kinetic sculpture, you know, with sound. Uh, yeah, so I hope it's not fixed. <laughs> uh, so the only thing which we added, mm, which we built as a museum, as the Museum of Modern Art, was we uh, built a greenhouse. So it was the only thing which we did, but it's not an artwork, you know, so we can always, it was like kind of questioned by the municipality, why do you do it? Like, you know, how can you like justify your spendings on a greenhouse? They said because of uh, carrots, like it grows well there, you know, like it's like, uh, it's used by the, but it was like the requests from the, those, uh, local people, you know, they wanted to have a greenhouse, you know, like, so we built a greenhouse and we also like recognize it as a venue. So mm, in the end, it became like a, uh, like a, yeah, like a conference hall, <laughs> you know, like more or less. So we had meetings there, uh, inviting such people as the company, as uh, Katrin Bohm, for example, this uh, German British artist who is, doing like a lot of uh, composting, fermenting, kind of cooking, uh, farming stuff. So she was uh, teaching us how to uh, work with uh, kombucha, you know, how to produce it, how to grow it and so on and so on, which was like very like popular. It was too popular for this space, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, so like, I guess like this kind of uh, craft of uh, strology, like walking around, you know, like discovering the place is kind of crucial in such situations. You know, you have those guides, you have like local artists showing us like the favorite places without really producing anything, just like mapping the place and recognizing the quality of the place, you know, like the, it was really entertaining. I have, I have to say like for the art audience, you know, like they really like the works, they like the venues. They like the stories. Um, so, uh, yeah, as the last slide from this section, I will have to speed up with the next two. Um, uh, 
yeah, like this, this, this gesture of like nominating something, you know, like appropriating uh, not only a work, like an object, but also like the whole city. It's like kind of an art historical thing, yeah? There's like this legacy, like uh, Alex Mlynarczyk, Stana Filka, and Zita Kostrova, how they uh, nominated Bratislava uh, in the 60s as, 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 uh, as, as the artwork, you know, was quite, you know, like uh, Claire Bishop wrote about it beautifully in her Artificial Health uh, book, how they appropriated like the whole city for like seven days, you know, that th this is the show. So they produce posters, they actually they ca calculated how many uh, trees, dogs, uh, cars, and uh, you know, like buildings participating in the show. And uh, it was be between the 1st of May and the 9th of May. So, you know, heavy stuff, you know, like the parades, you know, like military parades and so on. So they claimed that uh, whatever, like the photo taken during the, 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 you know, like in Bratislava between the 1st and 9th of May, 1965, is an artistic documentation. Yeah, because you are like, you know, capturing the, the performance, which was quite, as you see, well produced, you know, like with all those soldiers and everything. Mm. The second term which I would like to share with you is rewilding. And this is, uh, you know, one kind of tendency, uh, uh, you know, like in, in, in this kind of ecological restoration. Uh, um, mm, set of uh, possible methods uh, popularized uh, by the organization called the Earth First in the 90s. Uh, so, you know, they're like some kind of misleading uh, kind of uh, mm, uh, uh, interpretations of the term, like this old school 90s thing, you know, like this uh, rewilding, it's somehow, you know, it's, it doesn't work, you know, like this idea of, for example, like introducing uh, those like big fauna to Siberia again. So like if mammoths uh, are extinct, so why not to have like elephants there? You know, like, so this is like kind of, you know, something which is going on in, in, in South America, you know, for example, with uh, introducing, uh, uh, introducing some kind of like big reptiles or, or mammals, but it's not about it. Like the, the, the uh, kind of, you know, rewilding thing, like the Rewilding Europe organization proposes, it's like uh, uh, not doing anything. It's like stopping to do anything. You know, rewilding is about like uh, uh, recognizing that nature knows what to do. You know, so there's like this idea of having, yeah, actually our like, uh, uh, Nobel's awardee Olga Tokarczuk, the writer, she uh, advocates for leaving half of the planet uh, inaccessible for the humans. You know, this is her mission. She always like keeps like promoting this idea that we would like keep the balance, and this is the start. <laughs> you know, like this is like first half of the planet cannot be, you know, accessed by 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 us. So this is all about like this idea of like self-regulation, you know, like it's also like a little this kind of new agey hippie idea of, you know, like the Gaia system which is kind of calibrating itself and so on. But yeah, of course, you know, when you see, when you look at the even uh, uh, even the, during the lockdown period, you know, how the nature was kind of bouncing back, it's it's incredible. You know, like how I saw like in Warsaw, you know, like the the those meadows on the way to the museum, you know, like, you know, buzzing with insects, butterflies and everything, you know, it's quite beautiful. So this is like the, the, the concept from this kind of ecological restoration methodology, yeah? So humans are not allowed, things are happening, you know, like they are rewilding, but Let's like <laughs> grab this concept to our like museum work, you know, like what does it mean to like rewild uh, a museum, you know, which is like a very well cultivated garden, yeah? It's like very well trimmed and shaped and uh, there are many rules in the garden, <laughs> you know, like you don't touch, don't do, don't uh, run, don't pick uh, berries, whatever. Uh, so there are rules. Uh, I just wrote down a few of them, uh, like following this, uh, you know, the some 
teaching from, yeah, writing from Stephen Wright, of course, whom I mentioned, but uh, being kind of orphaned by him as he became like this permaculture figure, uh, I have to deal by myself of like finding more examples. But there are like, you know, th those kind of uh, regulations or like uh, little mm, hatches, you know, like to keep this thing uh, in one shape. You know, like so, so to somehow recognize what is art, what is not, what should we protect and conserve, what should be kicked out. You know, like so, so it's a kind of uh, you know con civil contract. You know, like that uh, art is singular. You know, like uh, it's not autonomous. You know, like we look at the thing and we know who did it. Yeah, it's like there's a label and we celebrate this person. You know, and uh, or uh, there's something about like ownership or like our uh, kind of position of uh, looking at things and uh, you know not questioning things just it's like very Kant thing you know like Immanuel Kant uh, you know uh, kind of uh, aimless uh, you know this function of art you know it's not to function it's not this is not the purpose of art you know like to serve you you know, it uh, doesn't have a function. Its function is to be functionless, you know. <laughs> so they're like the different things, but it's all leads to, yeah, to keep this guy alive, yeah. It's like, you know, to believe that the genie is there, you know. Like <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, to have the guy trapped in the bottle, which is our museum, and to make the people, like, admire this fact that it's not only about the oil on canvas, you know, it's much more, it's much deeper, it changes you, it's like triggers your imagination, it makes you a better person, and so on and so on. So there are like many um, uh, tools, like those scissors and knives to make it neat and uh, disciplined and so on, so it doesn't have to do a lot with rewilding. And I guess there are many artists, you know, many practitioners who can really rewild the system and make it rock. <laughs> I think mean John Latham was one of them, you know, like I really admire this guy, and uh, also like Barbara Steveni and uh, what they uh, achieved as the as the as the APG as the artist placement group. I think it was really about rewilding this system. So the for those who are not that familiar with the APG, it was a kind of uh, enterprise, a kind of cooperative uh, established in the 60s uh, for artists to be. Uh, placed in non-artistic environments. So they were paid to be so-called incidental person in hospitals, banks, uh, you know, TV programs, you know, like uh, uh, radio channels. Uh, they were even embarking on like um, those whaling ships, you know, like so one of the artists, uh, he did some crazy statues on the ship being bored and he with all those uh, fishermen they were like very like enthusiastic about making those statues and throwing them to the water you know it's like they're a crazy story about those placements you know how they resulted but it was all about now it sounds like super neoliberal you know from our perspective but it was like this idea this belief that uh, artists and their creative forces might change their working environment you know, so those artists who were placed, for example, in a bank, <laughs> you know, like they changes the mm, maybe bank is not uh, the best thing, but the town hall, for example, they can change the way things are being solved. You know, so they are like provide you with crazy ideas. You know, when you are get when you are stuck, you know, with those solutions. So they are those. Uh, creatures, you know, like messing around, you know, like uh, doing sometimes silly things, but also you can get there, you can get somewhere with them, you know, following them. So it was not about, uh, they had like salaries, like decent salaries for not doing artworks, you know, they are not supposed to do an artwork. Of course they did, you know, like, but uh, some of them. Uh, so, uh, so I just wanted to, so this is kind of like a rewilding thing in terms of like, you know, putting a plant, you know, letting uh, the plant grow somewhere else, you know, like in other, uh, you know, like uh, habitats, you know, like a hospital might be such a, such, such a place. It's not only about like, you know, this kind of white cube situation when you cannot touch, you cannot do anything, but maybe, you know, a surgery room is a place for artwork, for video installation, you know, 
some, I don't know, pp theorist kind of thing when you are being operated. Might help. You know, like the guys from TAC, this institution in Amsterdam, they uh, had like a proper research about those kind of uh, pain killing uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, forces of art. And they compared even like a placebo, like a fake or <laughs> Artwork, <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are not getting. It's not about this, those places. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know why I put so many images of APG gatherings, but I really like this. This period. ah, yeah, because of John Latham. Yeah, John Latham, one of the founders of the APG group, had like this commission uh, by the uh, town hall from Edinburgh in Scotland, and uh, they had to do something with those like coal uh, mining heaps. But they are like old mining heaps. They are called Five Sisters, like by the locals. And, uh, and they are from the 19th century. They are like very primitive kind of, you know, heaps of things. Like it's like this uh, sludge or something. And uh, so, so there was like an idea of doing something artistic with them. You know, like making like this, I don't know, Edinburgh <laughs> sign or, you know, or whatever. Uh, or removing them. You know, so John Latham was employed there. He was like going to the office, you know, like and uh, discussing it, making those uh, uh, phys uh, how do you call them? Like the studies on like um, possibility of like removing, adding something, and so on. Uh, so he came up uh, with uh, an idea. He did it like kind of secretly. He enlisted them as heritage site. You know, so so they cannot be touched. So I think it's a brilliant idea. You know, like this is a. Uh, environment for many uh, endemic species of insects and birds because they really like this this it's like it's there since the like 19th century it's it's like totally perfect for many creatures you know so um, it's a beautiful artwork yeah it's like changing the legal status of the of the thing to let them like rewild grow be there you know so yeah that's an example and uh, yeah, so they're like examples of practitioners such as OHO Group, for example, like the Slovenian collective, conceptual art slash uh, land art slash, uh, I don't know what, uh, escapology kind of practice. Uh, artists who were doing uh, like less and less and less, you know, like it was like even their like land art practice was more about like suddenly like changing the position of the, you know, of the, of the, of the plants with like a little string for a second, you know, not to really interrupt it, disturb it and uh, creating those like super complicated charge, you know, like this kind of cosmology, like those theories, diagrams and so on being so interesting, like being such an amazing group of people that they were like invited to be a part of this uh, famous legendary information uh, exhibition in, at MoMA. And this invitation kind of uh, made them paralyzed, you know, so they decided to establish a summer school to prepare, you know, like to discuss, you know, what might, might be done. And they vanished. They uh, established a hippie commune called uh, Sempash Family, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, and I, I recently uh, managed to get like the archives of the like archives of one of the photographers who visited them back then in the 70s, like 1970s. And uh, and this is just amazing, you know, like you see how art is a part of something else, you know, like they have uh, like beehives, they uh, milk goats, and they paint, they do installations, they make like those fantastic environmental pieces, they do something which is called lithopuncture. It's a, an acupuncture, acupuncture puncture for the planet. So they kind of uh, uh, track down the sick places and they put a rock on it. <laughs> to heal it, you know, like so. So Ojo was really fantastic, you know. It didn't survive a long, like the uh, long time. The the uh, the commune, like only one family still there, but uh, the way they were like uh, kind of combining uh, conceptual art, yoga, breathing exercises, and uh, you know, painting and so on. And also, how everybody was involved in it. You know, like there are beautiful photos of them, like the Sempash family installing a show in Zagreb. Uh, 
So children are doing it as well, you know, like everybody is doing it, you know, like it's like this massive uh, installation, quite beautiful actually. So, uh, yeah, I have really have to speed up now. So just like a few shots of things which I'm, we are doing now, uh, which is also about kind of APG kind of thing. This is about like placing art exhibitions, like contemporary exhibitions at primary schools. So this is what is happening now and which will be happening for the next few months. Uh, we delivered this box to 10 schools, like in small places, in small villages. And the box is full of like uh, surprises, full of uh, really nice uh, artworks uh, delivered by such artists as Sharon Lockhart or like uh, Slavs and Tatars Collective. Uh, this is Goshka Matsuga. It's like your uh, propaganda set uh, with uh, pronouns and uh, some like uh, uh, verbs and nouns like climate. <laughs> <laughs> like crisis, uh, so you can do your your poet like concrete poetry thing, you know. Like you can stamp it on the on your, the benches in your classroom. You can do like a little banner and you put it in your like next to your teacher's desk and so on. So uh, so this is a box uh, with new commissions, new artworks, which are not uh, tangible very often. They are very also like sets of choreographies, performances, and so on. So we have like people working with us, like Alicia Chichar, who is like a hardcore eco-feminist uh, fighter and uh, dancer, and Alicia helps to animate those scores and protocols which are to be performed. Yeah, this is like warning me that I really have to... Maybe I can stop, it's in my... Yeah, so just like, I know I have to finalize. So the endospore is like the final thing. I will try to compress it to like, let's say four minutes. Uh, the, the endospore is a, is a biological term. It's the kind of uh, form of a bacteria, of a mushroom, uh, which is created in the very harsh conditions. You know, you're, you have like those extreme temperatures. You have like, uh, you know, the lack of food is also like a obvious thing and to create this like form which is non-productive so it doesn't breathe it doesn't like grow it's there it stays there and waits <laughs> you know, like, until you know some like good things happen to it to the environment for example so it might stay long i was like uh, just talking to stephanie last night that uh, on the way to, to Trondheim, I read about this endospore which survived in a amber, a piece of amber, and there was like an insect, like a dead fly inside, and inside the dead fly there was like the spore of a bacteria, and it was like 65 million year old, and they managed to revive it. Like they opened, they cracked the amber piece, and the and it lived, and it was so disappointing because it was the same bacteria which lives in the same place now, so it didn't change, so it's like the same boring species, you know. So, uh, so okay, so I guess, of course, you know, like there are moments when, uh, you know, when uh, museums creating those endospores, you know, when they don't produce, when they become something else, and in this coalition, of course, I should say, uh, say something about Ernst Fischer and his like gesture of like opening the Malmö uh, Kunstmuseum to to refugees, to former concentration camp prisoners, mainly like Polish women who were imprisoned in the Ravensbrück camp. So, uh, so this is like a beautiful example, one of the most striking examples of of you know. Uh, changing the function of the museum, you know, so you have people like settling down there, you know, sleeping there, cooking in a museum, you know, and this is like a civic duty of a museum director to open it to refugees. And it's also connected, I know that my time is like, yeah, so I, I will not dive into it, but Maya Berezowska, one of the Polish artists, was there because of her caricatures of Adolf Hitler, which were published, you know, in the 30s in one of the French newspapers. So she was like tracked down by the Nazis, put in a concentration camp in Ravensbrück, and she ended up in Malmö, you know, leaving quite a few uh, drawings there. But uh, it's also like, you know, quite a striking example, you know, like how those like artistic 
biographies and you know like this museology this critical museology was kind of merging you know what might be done with the collection of maya how it was used uh, how those drawings were used during our anti-fascist exhibition you know which was of course definitely like, connected to the current political situation in poland and there are many i promise it was not like intentional to pick up examples from this region but i, I guess i ticked uh, uh, Sweden, Norway, and, and, and Denmark already. Palen Nielsen, a Danish anarchist and, and, and architect, whose, uh, yeah, whose, whose, whose archive I've been working with uh, now, uh, he, yeah, he created, you know this, better than me, but his, 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 his uh, exhibition for the Moderna Museet, uh, this, this playground, this so-called junk playground was also quite a statement of like rewilding, uh, uh, rewilding, but at the same like creating this kind of uh, non-productive uh, safety space for children. Yeah, it was like invaded by children. Uh, they, they were not producing artworks, they were just having fun. <laughs> yeah, massively with this, uh, with uh, heavy, you know, sound system, with those like vinyl records, you know, music a lot of like uh, sewing and uh, you know cutting and hammering stuff building uh, red communist flags and so on so it was really something uh, but there are many examples nowadays when the museums are just like kind of you know uh, stopping their programs and yeah this is like an obvious example you know like what we did during the lockdown period you know how such places queens museum became like food banks they were distributing like you know food uh, among uh, like neighbors and uh, so i guess this is also like a really interesting interesting moment to see at the uh, as uh, at the museums as uh, sanctuaries yeah as, as laura raikovic uh, she defined in her book like this legal status of a museum as a sanctuary you know literally like in the middle ages you know you are like a, a an assassin or somebody you know, like running away and hiding in a church because this is a sanctuary so you cannot be arrested you cannot be punished you cannot be killed there so yeah facing like the you know refugee crisis and now on the polish uh, belarusian border you know my you know like declaring that the museum is a sanctuary it's something yeah cities are becoming sanctuaries yeah there are like many american cities and canadian cities where, for example, a person which is like arrested for like uh, speeding up on the highway, and uh, all of a sudden it uh, becomes clear that this person is doesn't have like proper papers for living in the city. It's not reported, you know. Like so, it's you can get a fine for like speeding up, but this is not you are not ending up in some kind of like detention center. A few images which I added to uh, after our, our uh, conversation last evening is, is, is related to, oh no, I'm skipping Mila Laderman Yukilis. It's a beautiful Rashi Tarvin. It's also beautiful, it's fantastic. There are really people who can trigger our imagination, what might be done to, to, to institutions, how they can function, but uh, Anna Lawrence Halpin, yes, of course, yes. They are just his art historical examples, you know. But this is like contemporary to finish. Uh, this is uh, kind of our way of dealing with this kind of endospore concept, you know, like dealing with those like, you know, troubled, uh, you know, communities and, uh, uh, you know, our friends, comrades, uh, activists who are like close to the museum or close to our like uh, office for post artistic services. Last year, we decided to kind of appropriate this. Uh, idea uh, from Jerzy Ludwiński, he was a Polish theorist, now I have to explain this post-artistic thing. He, he was the guy who uh, labeled it like post-art, post-artistic, like in the 70s, uh, which sounds like a little bit too fancy, but it's very much also like very down-to-earth thing. Like Ludwiński was observing what was happening in the art systems, and uh, he was just, you know, saying, Probably it's not art any longer. You know, it's not something, it's not the same bottle with the same genie which we had. You know, like probably genie moved somewhere 
he lives in a different box, you know, he lives in this kindergarten or something, and we, we, we are doing, um, we even don't care about the bottles any longer, you know, like we, I don't know, it's not fun to dust them off them again, you know, so, so, so Ludwinski was, was writing beautifully, like in a very kind of, you know, uh, he was a good writer, you know, like with all those, like, you know, literary and kind of, you know, metaphors, allegories, and so on. It's a little bit of science fiction article theory uh, that uh, probably we shouldn't really worry also about not being able to name it our practice, our, like, daily job, you know. This is, like, uh, much more powerful what we do, you know, like, so we shouldn't worry, whatever it is, you know. Like. So post-art for him is, I know, you know, post is a very problematic prefix in the language, yeah, because it uh, kind of uh, implies that maybe something is over, but it's not. You know, like post-internet wasn't about like the end of internet. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> post-modernism might be like uh, us modernists might be much more modernist than you know modernism. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, it was more about like doing something, having this legacy, this experience, those competences and skills of doing art, looking at art, analyzing art, and so on. So thinking about it, we organized this summer. A post-artistic congress, you know, like, so taking care of all those people who were, like, on the streets for those years, you know, like, last years, exhausted, you know, like, really fed up with those, you know, front lines, you know, abortion rights, you know, like, climate crisis, you know, judicial system, refugee crisis, so on. So we created this kind of... Uh, environment, this, 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 this kind of summer camp in very much in the Ojo Collective style of like briefing together, like cooking together, having those um, lectures in those places, also like talks, because this is a congress, so we had some delegates like delivering those speeches. This is Agnieszka Tarasiuk talking about a menopause, you know, like, which is also like the other thing to be put in the lexicon, <laughs> you know, like a menopause is a very uh, timely metaphor for like a post-productive period, which might be also applied to institutions. It's uh, Agnieszka, like, she really killed it. You know, like, this was like uh, the most amazing uh, term which we uh, had, uh, you know, for her as a practitioner, as a, as a woman of certain age, and it was uh, just, you know, we had the vocabulary to talk about it, you know. And, uh, yeah, so they are just like images to give you like an impression of a kind of endospore kind of moment. So we have, for example, like the hunting platforms which we found, which were not modified. They were just recognized as deep listening platforms, you know. Mm -hmm. And those hunting platforms are on a very strange height, so we can really listen to those sounds. They are really amplified. And it also requires like, of course, shifts in the kitchen, because we had like more than 200 people and we have to feed them. So it was also about like sharing our like cooking uh, skills and competences and, uh, and serving it. Yeah, and the last image I will not explain. Uh, but I encourage you to read about cow tools. <laughs> as a kind of, uh, I don't know, as a, as a, as a, mm, Maybe as a topic for the next uh, kind of gathering, <laughs> cow tools. You know. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
I don't remember the name of the guy, but he was Gary Larson. Like, yeah, yeah. So people were really sending tons of letters, tons of like, you know, like angry letters, not understanding the joke. <laughs> so they didn't get it. And they were like infuriated, you know. And, uh, you know, there is something strange about the show, yeah? Because you, we recognized the show and it was the mistake. We were like misled to think that this is the top. So, so we have to like solve the, 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 the riddle with those two. And it makes people frustrated. You know? like so, so of course, you know, like it's only a joke, but when you think about uh, Alba Noe, which we touched upon a little in the morning, and his Strange Tools uh, book, I think is a perfect illustration what art might be. You know, it doesn't have to be understood, but it works. You know, it makes you frustrated, <laughs> it's motivated, and so on. But there is no story behind it. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are, as I said, running behind schedule. And if anyone wants to pick up snacks or or, or, or anything, they are in the back of the room. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Stefan Wellinger who is a professor of architecture here at uh, uh, NTNU, Trondheim uh, University. And um, so, well, do you need uh, time to set up? It's kind of a, the concept of strange making for me, at least. Um, Johan, you, you in, you, in, in your introduction, you talked about it's not about buildings, it's about activities, or maybe both. But as an architect, of course, I will talk a lot about the buildings. But this is not my presentation. <laughs> but of course, we can. Uh, yeah, we can talk about that as well. But. Uh, I would like to start with the disclaimer. This one is uh, looking good. Um, as you can see in the program, I got this brownish color. So um, the disclaimer, I will talk about buildings, of course, but I try to relate it a bit to the discussion, but uh, maybe not to Sebastian's very interesting discussions. But I. We'll talk about buildings in the relation of, of not the national museums and the, the largest institutions, but maybe on a, on a different scale of the mid-sized mid institutions. Um, and I will start a bit, uh, elaborate on, on networks. And after, after a while, I will talk about the physical networks. But I think it's quite interesting to to look at the intention of your network and the network uh, seminar here, which is to create museums that are better, more inclusive. And all these nice intentions, I think it's a uh, it's very good background for, for the discussion about the next museum or the future of the museum. Uh, but networks, I mean, in the last couple of years, we ha all have um, 
perceived art through the digital networks, the global digital networks, and I have used it a lot, quite a lot, because I mean we use art in the teaching of our uh, of our architecture students as well. This is the digital museum, of course, Norwegian Swedish uh, platform. It's a very important network, and I really acknowledge the efforts you all have been doing to to give us art experience during the pandemic. I mean, this is a local, local uh, exhibition, which I was uh, following from home. And it was really, really interesting to think about the, uh, the meaning of the object and of art and the building in this context, especially for me as an architect, when you suddenly had the spaces and not only the, the art pieces, when you had the spaces uh, in, at your home office. And, of course, the single artifacts. This is uh, Fjelltopper. You have it in your collection, Kaiseros uh, painting. I will come back to it a bit later. But I think this, uh, this pandemic, I mean, gave us new inputs about the discussion of, of, of the networks. But at the end of the day, as an architect, and maybe as well as a human being, I like the physical networks. And this museum is part of, of a very strong physical network. The museums in, well, is it now South Trendelag or Trendelag? But at least uh, a network of many museums. And I think that's quite interesting how you and this network of different physical localities share, now you share administration, you share, quite. I'm quite sure you share economic systems and all this, uh, this kind of, of uh, structures. But I mean, you will, uh, I think you, will, you share a lot of other discussions as well through this very physical uh, network. And of course, it's an organizational network as well. In this network, you share as I was into. So it brings me to the next, uh, the next point in my short talk, and I will keep it a bit shorter so that we'll have a break afterwards. It's about sharing. What, what is the potential of sharing in, the, in this physical world, um, which I'm talking about? Not only about the digital world, but the, the physical world. And one example uh, is about the space object dilemma. I'm quite sure many of you are very familiar with. This is not from my talk, but it's from by Ida de a couple of years ago. Um, and you see how many percent of your collections are exhibited. I don't know what is the number of, of your museum here, but it's maybe, maybe somewhere in between 2 and 20 percent. It's about two. It's about two, yes. And of course, I mean, but it's quite interesting that this is the new National Museum, the largest institution we have in this country. And they have 400,000 objects, 2% exhibited in the new museum. And that's quite interesting. I think that is quite interesting uh, in, in this discussion about what could we share and how could we use this as, as uh, an, an entrance to maybe to develop new ways of, of uh, showing our collections. And I'm quite sure that many of you are very familiar with the art, uh, uh, the art city Barcelo Bale, uh, which is the city of the oldest municipal art collection and a lot of museums. And of course, we all travel to this uh, fantastic city and, and enjoy the exhibitions there. But I'm more interested in what is the, uh, about the precondition of having the old museum there. Uh, and, and having this extension here. And I think the precondition which makes this possible is this. And has somebody of you visited the Schaulager? You have visited. As a, as a professional or as a public? As a professional. As a professional, yeah. And I think this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting example of, of kind of uh, different, a different concept and the reconceptualization of, of, a of the, the challenges of the museum and this space object dilemma. 
And uh, to make it short, I mean, you, show, you know, this is in a way the home of, of the art. This is the storage where the art lives, but it's accessible. And so we have temporary exhibitions here, but, and you as a researcher or as a professional, you can go there and, and study the art and visit the art at home, where the art lives, where the art stays. And I think that's a very, very interesting, a very interesting concept. I think it's Schaulage, it's almost 20 years ago, it opened, yes, 2003. And only three weeks ago, this one opened in Rotterdam. I uh, don't, don't care about the, the, the form of it and all these kind of things. I think it's not very important in this, uh, in this context. But what I think is quite interesting is to discuss how the art is displayed. And it's, again, it's, uh, uh, it's the, the storage of the art, of the collection. That's how the collection lives, and maybe it's curated. I think it's curated, but uh, it looks like it should not be curated. But it's not about only about uh, the collection, but it is as well about the workshops. And I think it's quite interesting how they added, in a way, a new dimension of, of the art experience, uh, as well for us as public, but as well as for you as uh, the museum world. So, um, just as a potential idea, I would like to present uh, a project done by two of my students, Sverre Ausnes and Christian Östervik. And they, they grabbed this idea of, of this space object dilemma in the museum and said, okay, how, what, what could we um, contribute to this discussion? And it was the Lade Kunstmagazin. And Lade is one of the most commercial areas. It's an old, uh, yeah, it's an old uh, airport from from yeah before the Second World War and the Second World War, and and the airstrip down here, and it's a lot of uh, uh, commercial uh, and not very interesting buildings uh, at Lade at the time being. But what is interesting is that. Um, I mean, we know, all know this with uh, the internet uh, 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 shopping coming and Amazon maybe is coming soon to, try and to, to Norway as well. We, we see that uh, there's a decay of these areas as well. And it will be, at least in the, in the near future. And this is how Lade uh, shopping area looks like today, parts of it. And maybe not in the Black Week and Black Friday, but... Uh, before and after. This, is, uh, this uh, was the situation the students met uh, a year ago. So their proposal was just to move, kind of establish a similar concept to the Schaulage in Bale in one of these shopping centers. Because shopping will decline, the area for shopping will decline, but your collections, they will always grow. I mean, that's, you collect and buy and yeah, get more funding maybe, and so this is uh, this is one of the ideas they developed, and so this is the idea. Then over time, when shopping area are declining, you just fill it up with art. And for you, for you, yeah, for uh, those of you who are familiar with the Norwegian brands, this is Biltema or Swedish brands. There is pharmacy and all these kind of things combined with art uh, and the collection. So I think it was a very interesting concept. And here we come back to Fjell Topir, the painting in the museum context, in the shopping mall. And somehow it brings back this uh, discussion to Duchamp when the everyday object moves into the, the museum and now the museum moves into the everyday world. And I think it could be very interesting, at least if Sebastian could elaborate on it and, uh, <laughs> and with all his uh, knowledge, I think it could be quite interesting to discuss the democratic value of, of moving art back or bringing back uh, or bringing art out in, uh, in a shopping mall and, and uh, recontextualize uh, art in, in that way. 
But as I said in the disclaimer, I'm an architect, not an art theorist. But, uh, but this brings me to the next discussion. It's the P for the proximity, or even maybe better, the P for the publicness. Because I think, for me at least, as a, um, as a user and, and visitor of art museums and galleries, it's very important to have access and accessibility to the art. And uh, probably you are familiar with uh, Nolly's map of Rome, which where you can see the black, uh, where the black is the privatized space and the white is the public space. And it's not only about the public, uh, what we often uh, um, perceive as the public space is the outdoor spaces. There are a lot of churches and, and other spaces which are public accessible. And uh, these white spots, all the white spots are the public sphere or the public or urban fabric of Rome at 1748. So now I think it's quite interesting then to think a bit about what kind of white spots do we have now in our cities. I mean, we have the public spaces, and it's snowing, it's raining, and we have all these challenges in, at 63 degrees north. But then we have the commercial spaces, but then we have maybe only the libraries left, which are the non-commercial public spaces, and they are uh, climatized spaces, not the outer spaces. And I think it quite, could be quite interesting to think a bit about how could uh, Ray Oldenburg's sociologist uh, concept of third places, also the home away from home, uh, be extended to the museums and to the art world. So it's not only the libraries who are the home away from home, the third place, as he calls it. I mean, this is the, the Dijkman Library, and I just said in the disclaimer, I'm not talking about the big institutions, but this is a very, very interesting building because it really works as the third place in Oslo, together with, all, with the network of all the other libraries. So, could museums be part of a network or establish a network of third places together with libraries and other places? And it's very important, this is not, it should not be commercial. I mean, we have third places which you perceive as home away from home, like cafes and these kind of things, but they're always commercial. So I'm talking about the non-commercial places. So what if this institution, together with the new sibling, sister and the new cousin in town and all these other art institutions and now I'm talking a very, about the very local situation in Trondheim could be the network of third places. Well, it already is maybe, but it could be developed further. And then there comes a game changer into it uh, when we are looking in the, at the local perspective as well. This is the new campus project. I mean, we're just sitting here somewhere, and uh, the, the Trondheim University is relocating uh, the university center from Dragwall, and as part of it, art, architecture, music, and art history is moving down here. So it's only a couple of hundred meters on the other side of the, the river, which I think it's quite interesting. I mean, and in the new European Bauhaus, they, uh, they state that they want to design future ways of living at the crossroads between art, culture, and science. And there is a lot of science here, but there is not much art and there's not much culture. So we need the art in this. So my proposal for the local context, but maybe could be applied for other, uh, in other contexts as well, but for the local con uh, Trondheim context is to, to map what kind of spaces do we have today, what kind of possibilities and potentials we have, and what maybe do we lack. And then we don't replace, but we add what we lack, instead of replacing and building up new institutions. And I think that's 
I will come back to it a bit later, but I think it's, it's a much more um, a concept, the concept is much more ad uh, adapted to what we see in 2021. These big institutions maybe belong to another time, at least uh, as I see it. So, and, and you maybe will answer, okay, this is a nice idea, but it's so difficult to get funding for operational costs and all these extra costs we have for, for this kind of networks where we have to transport to Gromelna, and we know all these discussions, at least the local discussions, we have to keep open Gromelna at the same time as the main building. But I think uh, we have to rethink how we think about economy in this context. This building costs about 2.7 billion Norwegian crowns. And operational costs are three times higher than the operational costs in this building. And then we leave this building behind, and we have still operational costs in this building. This is about economy. This building produces approximately 8 to 10 million kilos of CO2 in the normal lifetime of 60 years. So we talk a lot about ecology, and I think it's, it was really interesting to follow Sebastian's talk as well, but could we really talk about ecology in a building that produces 8 million kilos CO2? So I would like to have a bit more time than a couple of days to prepare for, for this kind of uh, discussion with you, but now I'm very concrete. And so I think we should uh, think together and develop new narratives. This is a very concrete example. Um, we have heard for many years that it's not possible to, to ban the, uh, the trucks from the city centers because you have to have waste management and delivery and all these kind of things. But then a couple of years ago in 2016, somebody in Stockholm said, yes, let's try. And it works. They use these electric bikes and some electric cars, and it's a new narrative for how we can run the city infrastructure. So, as I said, I would like to have a couple of more days to think about it, but my point is with this is uh, I think one possible concept could be, of course we can we can apply for funding for a billion, of, a billion crowns and build this fantastic new museum and all architects will be happy and there will be an architect competition and we will re get a lot, of, uh, um, uh, a lot of interesting discussions. Okay, I forgot one point about the, the, the Munk Museum. The, the, cost, uh, the, the cost of the building were 2.7 billion crowns. But if you take into account the all the discussions in the, in the Oslo municipality for years and years and years, and all the costs for this, if we could invest that in, uh, in discussions about art and our common future, instead of discussing a building. Maybe a bit strange that an architect says that, but, but my point is, uh, with this kind of net, network thinking, and if we could build up a new narrative about distributed responsibility, maybe collective intelligence is the outcome of, of this uh, new thinking. So, I don't know, we still have some minutes left, but uh, I'm actually here to learn. So, it's not about museums why, but museum buildings why. I would like you to discuss a bit with your neighbor and we take one minute and then maybe we find some good answers to that. Please.
Sorry, you can proceed if you want to. But apologize about my cheap trick to conclude my talk, but please. <laughs> but you, yeah, you need the microphone maybe. Okay, so for the streaming, we need to use the microphone. Um, who wants to start? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. We were discussing over here um, that there's uh, an important component, compom con component to this uh, desire of uh, making new grand uh, fancy uh, buildings, uh, which has to do with the way in which urban regeneration functions today, yeah. that you didn't talk so much about, but maybe you would want to comment on that as well, because what we were talking about is that um, uh, there's a strong incentive for cities today to make buildings that somehow promote the city and it's part of a, a cultural policy strategy that has been very dominating all since the 19s and the Bilbao phenomenon and so on. So how do you think about uh, you know, uh, this distributed network that you're suggesting is also not a very kind of uh, spectacular no. uh, way of thinking about museums. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. I, I expected that question. Um, <laughs> and of course, as I said, it's, it's since the 90s, the prevailing uh, concept of, of using, I would like, like to call it using the institutions and, and urban development. Um, um, and I think what this, coming back to how uh, Johan introduced the, the seminar, is if, if, if you really need the big building to make art relevant, then I think we have a challenge. And of course, I mean, I, I mean the, the Munch Museum in, in Oslo, it will work, it will be a fantastic, I haven't been there, so no verdict from my side on the architecture, but it will be, it will work. Because I mean, already now, I think they have 120,000 visitors in, a, in, a, in one month or something. It will work as, a, as this kind of concept. But I think if, and that's, that's why I didn't talk about the big national institutions, I think for the mid-sized cities, I, if for the relevance of art, it's much more important how the art works in everyday life instead of the, the, this kind of international Florida, Florida tourist approach where you, where you use art as a marketing tool. But I don't have the a very good answer, so that's why I would like to elaborate a bit on that in a couple of years. Then we can <laughs> maybe come back to that. But I think I think we have to rethink, especially uh, on the umbrella of ecology. We can't think anymore about building us out of of the ecological challenge we have. And and that's not only for the art world. I, I mean, I showed you this. Uh, this um, um, this new project for 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 the Antonio campus it's a big problem for us. I mean, we leave one of the best campuses in Scandinavia behind, and we build a campus where we have CO two emissions um, uh, in in the amount of ten thousand uh, uh, plane uh, travels from from Oslo to Trondheim annually. Is this right? And we talk about sustainable, uh, a lot about the, the sustainable university and this kind of thing. So it's, I, I don't think it's, it's, it should be anymore a question if we should or not. I mean, I mean for me, it's more like how could we develop the, the museums and the art as a relevant tool in, in, uh, to, for the narratives of the future without building uh, these, these symbols. But. That's my speculations. That's why I called this talk for speculations. But anyone else? Well, we we talked a little bit also about. I mean, this is diverging off to to a slightly different topic. But the, this notion of third spaces, of course, is very interesting in, and is in many ways. And I'm sure that the, the Kunsthalle and, and and we would agree that this is what we what we would like to be. And we look enviously at libraries who don't have to charge admission and, mm. and, 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 and can be a form of second living room. When it comes to museums, we are 
in a way encumbered by the fact that we have these sensitive and valuable objects that we have to somehow preserve also. So we will always be a slightly stiffer uh, third space uh, where you can't run around quite as much as in Palle Nielsen's uh, exhibition. But um, uh, at the same time, we want these spaces to be non-commercial spaces. Mm. We want them to be comfortable in the way that, that uh, activities, to say commercial activities that people are used to, that, 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 people, that, that people associate with, with, with the leisure time uh, are comfortable. But at the same time, we want to bring something else to that. And I would say that the, what, what is most logical and most economical to bring, bring to that is the residue of the old museum. It's, it, and to an extent, this is also what people uh, expect to meet here, and, 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 and this can be a, a kind of um, uh, a security, give a kind of feeling of security uh, to the visitors. So uh, I'm, I'm all for <laughs> trying, trying a new Trondheim model for, 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 for museums with, with uh, less building uh, and um, a more economic use of, uh, of the buildings. But uh, again, who, who will explain this? Who will, who, will, who will front this? So many intelligent people here in the <laughs> space. I mean, we, you work on narratives much more than I, I, as an architect, we work on very physical and concrete structures, but you work with narratives. We should get together. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we are running short of time maybe, or is there some, yeah. We are just discussing here about you know the difficulty to um, defend building new new things for like new buildings for museums, uh, especially in places like you know as you said mid-sized cities, it's more and more difficult to um, to defend that and it has to be very utilitarian first, um, as you said Johan collection uh, the needs for the collection the needs for for preservation but then also um, I saw this postcard a bit earlier here in the museum with a question, do you want to live temporarily or permanently? Mm. And it's also maybe we should also ask this question about the collections. How, how permanently is permanently? Uh, and how maybe it's, maybe it's an idea to just keep the size of the collection and then you, know, you buy new things and then you see what you do with other things maybe that you have to, I don't know, how, how, how further you have to go with all these things, how, how do you say, um, um, Immortal, this art could be, should be, or could be. So maybe um, this is also a thing, and it's one of the questions that we had in, uh, you know, in one of our works is uh, maybe related with this: Is it high time to cut eternal from the notion of growth? So you know, growth doesn't have to be eternal. It can be also degrowth, and or maybe you know, very, very, very sm small steps of growth and the organic, very organic. So yeah, just yeah. Yeah, thank you, and I will maybe have a closer look at the recording afterwards so that I really re uh, will remember, but this was my take on it before we had this little chat and, and before I saw Sebastian's uh, presentation. And I think what is quite important for bu that buildings should have an added value. It's not only about being, I mean, the, the shell of, of the content. Uh, and, and the third pl uh, place discussion could be, okay, of course you have, you have to have this, uh, or you have to deal with the expectation of this is a museum, available objects and all these kind of things, but you can still break down or build down the threshold to enter this space. I mean, I'm here a couple of times when you have an exhibition, which lasts for a, a couple of months. But so how could I be invited into, this, into your building every day? This kind of things. Sharing, we're into it. And then loose fit is, in a way, what you're discussing with elastici elasticity. I mean, it could be some, in periods, it, it should be a bit bigger, and some other periods, maybe you shrink. So loose fit is uh, a concept we use in, 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 in the urban discussions about not being too precise, and it's about. Uh, uh, as well about uh, discussions about resilience for the future. I mean, Elasticity could be bigger, 
shrink as well. Urban, accessible, and then the somatic. Um, you probably know the concept. Johan brought this in when we discussed uh, my talk in, in advance, and I think it's, in a way, a more uh, sophisticated way of discussing the network structure, and it could be quite interesting to, to look a bit further into it. But just to come back to, to the Trondheim situation, you wish, you wish to create museums that are better, more inclusive, and have relevance to a broader section of the publics they intend to serve. And you have to take a decision, you from Trondheim, where? And I think it's quite, it would be quite interesting to follow your decision, and I'm, <coughs> I'm very curious. No pressure, no, but uh, I'm very curious, but I think what maybe could be the backdrop for, for your decision is this, as we have discussed it, and, uh, and maybe as well a discussion about what this plus could be. It's not about not building, it's not about not creating new spaces, but maybe about discussing what we are missing. So, thank you. The only thing I missed today is uh, proper parking for my bike, but... Uh, it's in the budget for next year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I come back then. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we do we have any? Uh, should we do we have time for more questions or are we? Do we have more questions? Do we have more questions? Yeah. I just had a it was just if, uh, well. Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, would you mind just um, going back to the um, project that you uh, presented with the beloved city? Just um, if you would add a few uh, words to that, I didn't really, uh, or will you just explain it again, please? Just, I didn't really get what it was about. The no, it's, it's still there. The beloved city, it's, uh, it was uh, not very metaphoric <laughs> reference, it, it's very concrete. And for us in, the, in, in urban planning, it has always been a, a, a big challenge with uh, delivery and waste management, mm. one of the biggest challenge. Until, and nobody had a solution for that. So until uh, somebody in, in Stockholm actually built up uh, a narrative around that this might be possible with a hub, which is this, and a distributed uh, network where you could just simply use electric bikes like this one. This was more an invitation to maybe reconceptualize our thinking about the networks and how difficult they are. Because now suddenly they, they told us, and, and in this uh, beloved city project, they tell us that it's not that difficult, as we have assumed for many years, and it even gives an added value to the city, because everybody likes to see the electric bike delivering things in the city and, and taking the trash with it. And so that was not very metaphoric but very concrete example of building up a new a new narrative yeah but it can be very um, useful with the concrete example yeah. yeah thank you okay thank you very much Stefan um, no, did we have a break planned here yes and uh, a break to mingle with the microphone off. <laughs>